Master apologizes for assigning this unfavorable role. Tanakapoli responds, saying it's not as if the worst possible outcome will occur anyway. She then informs the master that they need to prepare immediately, emphasizing that it's just the two of them going, and they won't be easily defeated. Peppa chuckles and wishes Tanakapoli a safe journey. The master questions if she wasn't paying attention to what was just said, reminding her that she's also accompanying him on the journey. The master is well aware of how crucial the Dragon Veins Cave is. It's like the heart of Earth Mana. After completing the country's research on tactical magic, he believes they can harness the potent Earth's mana to boost the nation's strength. They can't just leave Dragon Un and the Dragon's Vein Cave behind. So, they have to find a solution to overcome this challenge. A week passed, and they finally reached the city, along with a few selected. From there, they ventured into the dreaded Cursed Lands. Little did she know, she would soon realize that her previous judgment was an immense understatement. Standing before them were a group of dark elves, accompanied by a stunning white elf girl. A two inquires about their origins, while Tana Kapoli questions if the girl was human. In response, a two simply smiles, radiating beauty without uttering a word. Tana Kapoli couldn't help but wonder if it was not just the girl, but the entire group of dark elves behind her that held a mysterious aura. With a single glance, she can tell that they are enveloped in a dense, foreboding aura. When someone inquires about the people ahead, she responds with frustration, expressing her desire to know as well. In a stern tone, she warns each of them not to even think about drawing their weapons. Tanakapoli is now slightly worried, realizing that things have taken a turn for the worse since they are just a group of beast men. Their primal instincts are reacting to the sinister aura. She is perplexed about what they should do. They are facing an adversary they cannot possibly defeat. Contemplating their options, she wonders if they should just turn around and flee. She's thinking about whether they should bear their animosity upon them. Atu takes a moment to think and then calls Gia, instructing him to give the order for everyone to stand by. He nods in agreement to her command. Tanakapoli contemplates what it means to stand by. She wonders if that implies they have no intention of fighting them. She believes that little girl is exceptional compared to the others. And before the soldiers do something foolish, she wants to take action. Suddenly, Pepe raises her hand and asks if she can have her attention for a moment. This surprises Tana Kapoli and the others present. Pepe greets Atu and introduces herself. She asks Atu about her own name. And eventually, they find themselves strolling through the forest alongside Atu and the Dark Elves. Pepe's words had a mesmerizing effect on the wretched creatures, causing havoc in Forngwen. They were completely enchanted by her magic. She turns to Atu and asks if she heard what she said. Atu nods in agreement and wonders why this child is so drawn to her. Tanakapoli apologizes for Pepe's behavior and ponders over how Atu mentioned that their desire to meet their king has helped avoid any unnecessary conflicts between them. Atu explains to her that every living being possesses an innate survival instinct ingrained in their souls, which is only awakened when faced with danger. She requests her forgiveness for the impoliteness of their soldiers. However, Tanakapoli still finds the dense miasma within the forest unsettling. As for Pepe, well, she's just a stubborn fool, so everything should be all right. Now, the genuine monster of a young girl mentions something about the king they worship and serve. She wonders what lies ahead for them on this earth. Lost in their thoughts, they eventually arrive at Takuto's castle. As they face him, Tana Kapoli reflects on the sinister nature of their neighbors. She comes to the realization that Takuto is a malevolent deity. Snapping out of her reverie, she respectfully bows before him and expresses her delight at being in his presence. She informs him that they come from Forngwen. Suddenly, Pepe chimes in, introducing herself to Takuto and expressing her pleasure at meeting him. She takes a step forward and requests Takuto to be his friend, no matter what. Tanakapoli quickly apologizes for Pepe's immature actions and blames it on his nervousness. Upon hearing this, Takuto replies that they can indeed be friends and assures them that they will get along just fine from now on. Atu praises Takuto for making his first friend and encourages everyone to applaud. As soon as everyone hears this, they gather and begin clapping. Before joining in the applause, Tanakapoli reflects on how unexpectedly this situation has turned out. 
Pepe may seem naive, but he treats everyone equally and without fear. This quality allows him to easily connect with others. Takuto observes Pepe and mistakenly thinks he is the leader, when in fact he believed the Ox Lady held that role. Despite the mix-up, he is optimistic about building a good relationship with them. The scene shifts to a grand feast where Takuto's group and the Beast Men are enjoying a meal together. Takuto and Pepe stand apart from the crowd. After a delightful feast and successful discussions, they bid their goodbyes to Tanakapoli, Pepe, and their companions. After bidding them farewell, Atu, the heroic leader of Minogri Unit, commends everyone for their exceptional work today. She applauds the collective effort that enabled them to forge amicable ties with the foreign gone. Gia, the captain of the warrior squad, expresses his delight at this momentous occasion for their peaceful nation. Accompanying them are Molter, the chief of the Dark Elf tribe, EML, the private secretary, and Marier and Carrie, the ladies-in-waiting. Finally, King Takuto extends his heartfelt appreciation to all for their unwavering dedication. Atu tells him that when they initially encountered Dragonton and mingled with the top-notch personalities of Forngon, she was always on edge. Right after that, they engaged in a battle with those holy knights. Molter updates them that the holy country Qualia currently doesn't seem to be taking any actions against them. As anticipated, it appears that they have shifted their focus entirely towards the issues in the northern region. Atu considers it a great opportunity to concentrate on strengthening their country's influence. They have managed to reach a successful agreement with Forngon. She mentions the importance of reviewing the specifics discussed during the negotiations and their meeting with Forngon. She asks to go through the details once more and wrap it up. These are the terms of the agreement for the alliance they made yesterday. Forngon will provide metal equipment, daily essentials, and other consumables in exchange for food from Minogra. Minogra will assist in eliminating the barbarians who raided Dragonton. As part of the deal, both parties will oversee the management of Dragon's Vein Cave together. They found the cave to be the best part of the agreement, giving them exclusive rights to it. The food was so delicious that they jokingly called it corrupting food. The investigation into Dragon Un confirmed that they were under attack. The origins of the barbarians remain a mystery to the governments involved. Since they are clueless, they opted to push forward with the investigation. Atu believes that defeating different types of units will greatly boost his power. They have the potential to completely eliminate the barbarians in one go if they attack at the right time. She currently possesses 13 battle powers, more than goblins, giants, and knights combined. Additionally, a sizable portion of the skill that the destroyed units possessed will be transferred to this unit. The subject of their developed diplomatic relationship is the next item on the agenda, especially regarding their agreements on mutual trade and defense pacts. EML asks if anyone has any questions or comments on them. Everyone continues to think about the specifics in silence. Carrie tries to speak up out of nowhere. EML inquires about her query. Carrie expresses her curiosity, admitting she has no understanding of what kind of country Forngon is. As everyone gathers around, they inquire if that's the specific information she seeks. Molter voices his agreement, echoing the sentiments of the group. Despite having compiled and presented identical information to the king, they remain largely uninformed about Forngon's internal affairs. At present, their knowledge is insufficient to engage in detailed discussions about the nation. From their perspective, the pressing concern is the perilously close proximity of the Great Cursed Land to Dragonton that is vulnerable and unable to defend itself against barbarian threats. Takuto ponders that they only know what they see on the surface from their previous encounters with them before. When discussing diplomatic ties, it is crucial to pay attention to even the smallest details about the countries involved, including their beliefs and the gap between their wealthy and impoverished populations. Takuto reflects on the fact that because the game system took care of everything, he didn't notice it until now. Their blind spot lies in the requirements that have not been implemented into their status. This indicates that delving into the Forngon is essential. However, if they did manage to send envoys to Drangentan, it would already be too late for them. Moreover, even if they wanted to, the current situation makes it challenging to engage in trade. EML proposes that, in this scenario, it would be best to postpone their investigation of the Forngon in order to prioritize mutual trade. 
Batu disagrees and emphasizes that gathering information in Drangantan should be their top priority. Jia joins the conversation and suggests that instead of waiting, they should send the envoys they initially planned to send to Dragon on ahead of schedule and continue their investigation. Yamel is worried about the situation because at the banquet, they mentioned that the barbarian attacks have been happening more frequently than usual. Moreover, this outbreak happened unexpectedly, and they have no idea when the barbarians will target Minogra. Given these circumstances, it would be a smart move to send envoys led by a two, who is a hero in their county. This way, they would have the necessary support to defend their king in case of an emergency. The conference table fell into silence for a few moments as everyone contemplated the situation. Takuto ponders the unexpected requirement of fulfilling certain criteria for sending out personnel and officials on diplomatic missions. It's crucial to meticulously choose the right individuals for the task. Out of the blue, Marie stands up and enthusiastically declares her intention to join in. Everyone's taken aback and attempts to comprehend her request. Carrie rises from her chair and approaches Marie. She then informs the group that Pepe gave the green light for them to come over and have some fun. Takuto is left astounded by this unexpected suggestion from Pepe. He remembers the words Pepe told him, that not just Takuto Kuen, but everyone from their group is welcome in their country. He quickly agrees, mentioning that as long as it's for leisure, it should be fine. He then inquires with EML about the possibility of sending some individuals for a friendly visit before sending official representatives. She nods affirmatively, suggesting they could pretend to be stopping by to show respect to the city elders. They would likely be thrilled that they came by beforehand. Hearing this, Takuto considers that as long as the person is a Minogra citizen, he can share visions with them. The only decision left is who to send. Both Marie and Carrie volunteer and promise to do their best. Takuto looks at them and wonders if it might be risky for them to go. EML immediately rejects the idea, stating that it's not appropriate to involve young children in such a dangerous task. She suggests sending Molter instead if it's just for a simple greeting. Takuto agrees, but points that Molter might not be the best choice for the job. This confuses everyone. Gia explains to Takuto that he is considered a wise elder by them, but in another country, he holds a position similar to that of a prime minister or minister of magic. She warns that if they only greet city representatives, it could cause a major uproar. Molter somberly responds to Gia's remarks, pointing out that by that logic, Gia would be a general and EML would be the minister of domestic affairs, indicating that their positions are much higher than they realize. It's not possible to just send a regular person. The way someone behaves and their role shouldn't be too important. Molter proposes that it might be a good idea to let the attractive girls go on the very careful journey, wondering if they are the most suitable for the task. Takuto shouts, questioning if it would be risky. Atu speaks out, mentioning that the king is concerned about this and wonders why no one else is worried that these two could be taken or worse. She declares that she will be the one to go. Molter chimes in, stating that Lady Atu is the king's most trusted advisor, which is precisely the problem. Atu turns to him, inquiring about the problem. He explains that they are unable to send someone in the role of the king's confidant, which happens to be her. She is left feeling puzzled, but they have no other option since she holds that position. Upon hearing this, Marie intervenes, mentioning that his majesty had given them the freedom to be of service to the king. This was one of the freedoms they desired, and despite knowing the risks involved, they are ready. They stand before him asking for permission to proceed, gazing into his eyes. Their plea touches Takuto's heart, causing him to lower his head and grant them permission. Both Marie and Carrie are thrilled by this news. Atu feels a surge of jealousy when she sees her king paying attention to other girls instead of her. She gives a sharp look to Takuto, who is engrossed in conversation with the sisters and EML. EML asks Takuto what they should do for their escorts if it's just the three of them to which he assures him that he has a plan for that. Just as he is about to leave, Molter calls out to him. Takuto turns back to Molter and inquires about the matter. Molter reassures him that it's nothing important, he just wanted to double-check something about Lady Pepe. Although he doesn't object to their agreement, her behavior and comments indicate that she was acting without a solid plan in place. He inquires of Takuto whether he genuinely believes that they are deserving of forming an alliance with her as their leader. 
Takuto ponders over Moulter's words and recollects that Pepe was indeed so peculiar that it caught everyone's attention and caused concern. Now he questions whether everything she said truly reflects her genuine emotions. He does have some reservations, but he believes it will be all right. Moulter gazes silently at him for a moment, then he humbly bows before him, expressing his compliance. The scene shifts to Marie and Carrie, who are standing in front of a tall building. Carrie asks if this is the medical treatment facility. It is indeed a medical treatment building and it provides recovery for all units residing within its premises, eliminating the drawbacks of minor illnesses. A place for healing illnesses. Takuto had a desire to construct it because the cost was nearly as low as the human flesh tree. Emil informs them that they should now discuss the magic research facilities. A two, upon hearing this, makes a displeased expression and lets out a sigh of annoyance. Takuto glances at her and realizes that she has been in a sour mood since their last meeting. Marie approaches him and suggests that he can express his gratitude in a certain way. She whispers something into his ear. After hearing it, Takuto beckons it too and whispers something into her ear. Upon hearing his words, she blushes instantly and covers her face. Afterwards, she inquires about the presence of their escort. As they continue walking, they come across a number of towering crowman positioned before them. Marie and Carrie gaze at them with wonder and question if it is indeed their esteemed king, Ira Takuto. The crows immediately lower themselves in front of Takuto and urge him to give his commands. A two, filled with curiosity, wonders if this is a medical team. Takuto responds, stating that he anticipated the need for them, making it a perfect arrangement especially since the Dark Elves became citizens of Minogra, their overall health has significantly improved by solely consuming the food provided by Takuto. He gazes at the crows who are standing silently and remarks that despite all the things he has created, they always seem to be idle. He also acknowledges their special abilities as an added advantage. A two compliments Takuto, recognizing his qualities as a great king. She directs her attention towards the crows and declares that she will now convey the words of their king. Pointing towards Carrie and Marie, she instructs them to accompany them to Dragonton and thoroughly observe the culture and current affairs there. The crows echo her words, emphasizing the importance of culture, escort, and observation. Atu appreciates this humane behavior and anticipates a reward from the king in the near future. Takuto speaks up, addressing the group who now serve as escorts under the command of these two individuals. He announces his intention to give them all human names. Excitement fills the air as he bestows the names Aikiru, Jairu, and Saburu upon them. The three of them are thrilled to receive their new identities as humans. Aikiru agrees with Jairu, affirming that they should complete their mission flawlessly. Saburu chimes in, assuring them that he won't forget. Takuto chuckles as he observes their conversation, realizing that his attempt to come up with a name without considering the game has already sparked their enthusiasm. Carrie watches them and remarks that there is one thing left. Instantly, they inquire about what it is. She asks them if they will definitely pay attention to their words. They immediately shout in agreement, which fills Marie and Carrie with immense excitement. Takuto inquires about Carrie's emotions to which she replies that she will give her best effort. Atu offers her support, suggesting that if she encounters any difficulties, she can confide in her. Carrie nods affirmatively, her gaze fixed on Marie who is joyfully interacting with Aikiru, Jairu, and Saburu. EML enthusiastically informs them about the upcoming event of going outside for the first time, mentioning that she has prepared formal outfits for both of them. She transforms their clothing into stunning new dresses. Upon seeing them in their new attire, she compliments them, stating that they look beautiful and exude the vibe of girls ready for a fun adventure. She wanted to give them a completely different look from their usual traditional clothes. Carrie ponders that it's similar to a two style. As they stand before Takuto, who is seated on his throne, he mentions that he is only using shared vision with Carrie this time. He instructs her to reach out to them through telepathy if anything goes wrong, as he has already taught her how to do so. Carrie requests him to entrust the task of observing Dragon unto them. The escort crows also screech, urging them to leave it to them and swiftly fly away. As Takuto waves goodbye to them, he wonders if they will be fine. Atu proposes keeping an eye on them from the conference room. 
Marie and Carrie have been safely accompanied to the city, which happens to be the multicultural Forngon City Hall. The scene transitions to the interior of a building, where a girl is passionately expressing her desire to quit working here. Suddenly, a young girl emerges, clutching a bottle of drink in her hand. This young girl is none other than mayor of the city, Antelli's Antique. She rests her head on the table and trembles as she expresses her frustration. Just when she thought she could finally escape the decaying forest of El Anar and start living her own life, these strange barbarians suddenly appeared a few months ago. In a tired voice, she explains that it happened right when she believed she could settle down with a partner and retire. She doesn't care about the world or the couples anymore. They can all go to hell. She asks her secretary to take a look at the overwhelming piles of documents and questions why she has to work so hard. The secretary carefully examines the documents, but what can she possibly say in response? While the mayor continues to express dissatisfaction, just recently she mentioned that the staff informed her about the possibility of engaging in diplomatic discussions with the country of Ruin, Minogra. This country, ruled by an evil god, is causing frustration for the mayor. Not only does she have to deal with various issues, but she is also being told to collaborate with this force of darkness to combat the barbarians. She finds it irritating and wonders if she should sarcastically ask if they have any human livers as a tasty snack. The officials expect them to cooperate and communicate, but the mayor lacks knowledge about the dark attributes, aside from what she has read in some writings. The current situation is really bad, right? Tonicapoli immediately left leaving everyone confused, and poor Pepe couldn't even understand what was going on. Suddenly, there is a loud knock on the door. The door swings open, and in walks a beast man, calling for Mayor Antique. Mayor Insanity shouts, asking what the problem was and if there was something the beast man needed from her. Annoyed, she glanced at the beast man and he informed her that there were people who wanted to see her. With an irritated expression, she assured him that she didn't have any meetings scheduled for today. She tells him to just forget about it and send them away. She annoyingly expresses to him that her time is more valuable than gold, and she feels like she's going to die if things continue this way. Beast Man lets her know that those individuals are representatives from Minogra. Grabbing her face powder, the mayor immediately shouts at him that they are very important persons, and she will be there right away. Meanwhile, Marie and Carrie are seated on a sofa with their escort crows standing next to them. The mayor approaches and takes a seat in front of them. She quietly watches them with a smile and thinks to herself that they are an incredibly risky group. She questions why the elders in charge would make a deal with such dangerous individuals. She wonders if they have lost their minds, as even the spirits seem to be afraid of them. As she snaps out of her thoughts, she greets them in the city of Drangentan proudly stating that she represents the city. Carrie expresses gratitude for the warm welcome, mentioning that they all hail from Minogra and she is Carrie. Marie chimes in, introducing herself as the elder sibling. The mayor muses that these young ladies are in charge, with the three men accompanying them as their guardians. She is familiar with the land of Minogra and its dark elves, but she wonders what kind of individuals these two girls are. She chuckles at the name Airful, then remembers Tonicapoli's description of them as the next generation of the elite class. She ponders whether the Airful sisters received guidance from the king. It surprises her to think that they are influential figures themselves, instructing her to speak with the two without any prior preparation. She contemplates why they shouldn't head to the capital and instead venture out to the countryside. She questions if it's a form of intimidation. The thought of the troubling relationship between elves and dark elves makes her anxious. Suddenly, Jairu approaches Carrie and asks if he can have a word with her. She turns to him, giving him permission to speak. He then turns to the mayor and explains that they are visiting at the request of the staff bearer Pepe, suggesting that they should come and check in from time to time. And according to those words, they have arrived here as scholars who are interested in studying the way of life in different countries. The mayor questions them, asking if they are here for negotiations or to discuss a specific agenda. Jairu replies, assuring her that if it is related to those matters, someone else will be present on another occasion to handle them. He suggests that she simply considers this occasion as a friendly greeting from them. The mayor's eyes well up with tears as she expresses her gratitude for their visit, realizing that they have come only to introduce themselves. 
She contemplates that their purpose here must be nothing more than a collective study of some kind. She feels relieved that things turned out this way because she only had a few minutes to prepare. However, she still needs to be cautious not to offend them even slightly. Carrie, in an embarrassed manner, mentions that it's their fault for visiting without prior notice. The mayor contemplates that there is no doubt that the king of Minogra, who showed great favoritism towards these children, has a preference for young girls. Then, with a warm smile, she assures them that she will take care of their accommodations and guidance. Marie and Carrie are thrilled to hear this. Jairu expresses that they initially thought it would be an audacious request, but if that's the case, they would gladly ask her for help. The mayor is happy to oblige and promptly gets to her feet. Putting on her coat, she inquires if they should leave now, considering she could use a break. Leading them out of the building, she proposes starting from the commercial district, which is the nearest to the city hall. She encourages them to ask any questions about the city, as she is familiar with every corner. Carrie asks why Unisan is giving them a tour of the city. In a warm tone, the mayor insists Carrie to call her Aunt Elise. She explains that they are strolling through the city because it's important to take breaks and relax every now and then, offering it as a piece of advice. As the girls gaze at her, they are amazed by the size of her breasts. While exploring, Carrie can't help but still ponder about it and curiously asks the mayor about the main food source in this place. The mayor explains that since this area is located in the deserted lands, it is completely different from the northern region. Unfortunately, Food production is limited here, resulting in small crop yields. The staple foods mainly consist of wheat, millet, and cactus plants. Additionally, they have a selection of dairy products, including cheese. On special occasions, they indulge in binbel birds, which require minimal food and are reserved for celebrations. The cactus cheese is a well-known delicacy, but it's absolutely disgusting in taste, so she wouldn't recommend it at all. She despises the flavor of it even before it's fermented. Carrie mentions that they have incredibly tasty alcoholic beverages in Minogra, and there are also discussions about trade. The mention of spirits surprises the mayor. Carrie informs her that these beverages are referred to as the heavenly nectar. The mayor is taken aback by the idea of this heavenly nectar. Carrie suggests that she could ask her king to gift it to the mayor. She is genuinely thrilled by this suggestion. After arranging accommodations for them, she bids farewell, assuring them that she will return in the morning to pick them up. Carrie believes that Aunt Elise is a genuinely kind and free-spirited individual, without any hidden agendas. Even if she did have one, Carrie thinks she would have to be extremely cunning. Carrie contemplates whether they should remain vigilant while consulting with Aunt Elise, but they are already grateful for the one available spot. As they sit inside the house, Carrie informs them that it's time to go over the findings of their investigation today. She asks them to share any specific observations they made. What stood out the most to them was their overwhelming sense of fear. There's no food available, no one is coming to offer assistance, and the presence of enemies outside is quite terrifying. Marie and Carrie can relate to these emotions, having experienced similar situations before. They can sense the uncomfortable atmosphere in this location. It appears that the tensions between different races are impacting the overall public order. Although everything seems fine on the surface, there are individuals giving her unpleasant looks. It's even possible that there are kidnappers and criminals lurking around. Jairu immediately assures them that no matter what happens, they will do their best to protect them and ensure their safety. So, there shouldn't be any issues. Carrie grabs hold of a poppy weed, which happens to have a seed as well. Jairu informs her that they purchased it during their journey. Carrie mentions that the milk extracted from the seed can be used as a drug that induces euphoria. After all, this plant possesses hallucinogenic properties. Jairu questions whether it truly qualifies as narcotics, stating that her explanation sounds quite childish, just like her. He goes on to explain that it's actually a well-preserved wild plant, as there isn't even a hint of damage caused by insects. This suggests that it is cultivated and distributed within the city. However, appearances can be deceiving as the situation is far from peaceful. He desires to avoid getting involved in any conflicts. Marie inquires whether humans have a strong affinity for conflict. Carrie glances at Jairu and mentions that during their previous encounter, he assisted her when she experienced a mental lapse. 
Even though it was only a small gesture, he proved to be reliable. These words were not spoken by Carrie, but rather conveyed directly from the king himself through telepathy. Emel then inquires about their activities throughout the day. The next day the sisters step outside to take in their surroundings. They find themselves in a beautiful location known as the Dragon Vein Cave. The mountain has been cleverly camouflaged with earth and sand, but it seems that not everything could be hidden. Marie settles down on the ground and gently touches a small, exquisite crystal that feels cold to the touch. Carrie marvels at its beauty and wonders how the countless crystals buried beneath the surface would look if they were unearthed. Unfortunately, Antelis couldn't join them due to a recent barbarian attack. It's surprising for her to discover the Dragon Vein Cave in a residential area. Carrie reminisces about their mother's wise words, reminding them that there is an abundance of wonders in the world yet to be discovered. Countless enchanting places and extraordinary things exist that Carrie is unaware of. Gazing up at the sky, Carrie affirms their determination to live by their mother's teachings. Suddenly, a voice interrupts their thoughts, mentioning the exceptional growth of poppy weed in this area. A man steps forward, apologizing for his sudden interjection. He introduces himself as Vesta Crucklane, the owner of a local company. Curiously, he inquires if Carrie and their companions are part of the Minogra delegation. Carrie glances over at him and inquires about what assistance she can offer. He expresses gratitude for the purchase of their product the day before. He suggests that if they were able to cultivate poppy weed throughout the entire clearing, they could make a substantial profit. However, the mayor of the city is attempting to disrupt their thriving business with unnecessary regulations. As a result, he proposes that they work together with their country, which oversees the joint management of this area. He mentions that he is interested in discussing business matters with them. Observing their expressions, he chuckles and acknowledges their concerns about their relationship with the city's mayor. He gives them a map, suggesting to meet tonight. They are happy to receive a map. They meet the mayor who is glad to be back. They enter a building, and as she pours the tea, she mentions to them that it happened really quickly and wonders if they enjoyed their time in Dragonon. Carrie nods and expresses their gratitude. The mayor reflects on how well she connected with the girls, expressing reluctance to see the girls leave, but reminding them that it's almost time to return to Minogra. At that moment, Vesta appears and politely asks if they could wait a little longer before departing. The mayor is taken aback to see the president of the Crook Lane Company. She immediately stands up and demands to know who gave them permission to come here, ordering them to leave. He expresses his regret to her for not being able to meet up with her last night. He inquires if they have any interest in the poppy weed business. Upon hearing this, the mayor contemplates whether it could be that the nation of Minogra and the Kirkerain Company have formed a business agreement. She shudders at the thought of a criminal organization disguising itself as a trading company, engaging in threats, assaults, murders, and fraud. If they team up with Minogra, they won't be prepared to handle such chaos and this city will descend into chaos. Observing her anxious expression, Carrie asks if something is amiss. She informs the mayor that they were recently given a map and engaged in a lengthy conversation. While enjoying her tea, she inquires about the fate of the town's staff and the soldiers on duty. Vesta rudely interrupts, expressing his disappointment as he had hoped for a positive connection with them. In response, he menacingly retrieves a syringe and advances towards the mayor. The liquid is the refined essence derived from the opium poppy fruit. It is believed that once you're exposed to it, you'll be unable to live without it for the rest of your days. The mayor gets jittery upon spotting it and questions if he intends to administer it on her. Carrie looks at her with apprehension. Vest assures her that he understands she must have numerous queries. She gazes at the mayor's anxious expression while Vesta, wearing a sinister grin, stands beside him. She expresses her reluctance to jeopardize her relationship with Forngon by engaging in any unnecessary actions. Carrie firmly reminds Vesta that causing harm to Forngon is equivalent to harming Minogra, and he should not underestimate this fact. The mayor locks eyes with Vesta and dares him to proceed with his intentions. He confidently steps forward, claiming that if that's the case, then everything will turn out fine. With a single injection, he promises to transport Carrie to paradise. He orders his subordinates to severely beat others and ensure that one of the twins remains alive. 
Consequently, the twisted ruler Takuto will become submissive to him. While he charges towards them, an unexpected object collides with him, causing him to crash to the ground in terror. Suddenly, the medic unit of Minogra, known as the Brain Eater, arrives. This unit possesses distinctive skills and capabilities. One of their remarkable abilities is providing a boost to uphold law and order in towns and cities inhabited by humanoids. The second benefit involves giving humanoids a boost in their attack power, while the third benefit provides them with increased resilience. The city is under the control of a malevolent deity. The medical personnel are offering assistance as escorts. The primary race in Minogra, the homunculus, is not considered humanoid. Normally, this unit would be ineffective in the early stages of the game for Minogra, but those who have a strong affinity for humans are well suited for this scenario. The escort crows are undergoing a transformation to appear more human-like. Jairu believes that prioritizing one's desires above all else is a truly human trait, which he finds admirable. And if they put on their own skin, they can become even more like humans. Marie immediately rushes over to the mayor and embraces her, reassuring her that everything is fine and that the escort team is not frightening. Vesta ponders whether they are referring to wearing human skin. Carrie's demeanor takes on a menacing tone and she declares in a sinister voice that she will never forgive Minogra's enemies. Furthermore, she will not grant forgiveness to anyone who poses a threat to those she cares about, those who have harmed her older sister, and those who disrespect his majesty. Thus, she commands the Birdman with the freedom granted by her king. They are granted permission to act as they wish. The escort crows swiftly advance toward Vesta, accusing him of insulting their cherished women and declaring that his skin must be peeled to make up for it. With grim determination, they prepare to launch their attack. In a panic, Vesta immediately apologizes, offering them wealth, goods, and anything they desire. However, the escort crows, with menacing expressions, close in on him and demand, in a chilling tone, to make amends by converting them into humans. Without waiting for Vesta's response, they immediately begin to pierce and shred him and his companions into pieces. The mayor trembles in horror at the gruesome scene unfolding before her. Carrie approaches her and gently calls out her name. Apologizing profusely, Carrie expresses regret for the chaos in her room, admitting she never imagined the Birdman would escalate the situation to such extremes. In response, the mayor reassures Carrie stating that it's all right and she understands. She agrees to convey the events to her superiors in a more favorable light. Carrie expresses her gratitude for the mayor's understanding. However, before the mayor can ask Carrie something, her thoughts are interrupted by the arrival of the Birdman. One of them speaks in a seductive tone, claiming that the mayor experienced a bout of incontinence and needs human consideration. The mayor quickly assures them that she's fine. Carrie admonishes them to stop fooling around, mockingly calling them bird brains. The mayor silently sits and listens as they argue, splashing blood everywhere. Despite the grim situation, she can't help but let out a laugh, remarking on their silliness. The twins just got back from Dragon Un yesterday. Luckily, they made it in time for today's meeting. She realizes that time is running out and decides to gather the representatives from each district to come up with a plan immediately. She informs Carrie and Marie about the meeting and suggests calling each representative. Both of them nod in agreement. The scene shifts to a two commanding Marie, Carrie, and Takuto to kneel. Now, all three of them are kneeling in front of her. She looks at them angrily and expresses her frustration that the twins and the brain eaters caused chaos in Dragondon. They even went as far as dissecting a person right in front of the mayor. Furthermore, they attempted to conceal their actions by leveraging the authority of the king of Minogra. She yells at Takuto, questioning why he allowed them to get away with it. She inquires if it wasn't his responsibility to monitor them and prevent such incidents. In a trembling voice, he replies that he didn't want them to resent him for reprimanding them, considering their vulnerable age. A two angrily shouts, demanding to know if he is their father. She passionately reminds him that they had discussed this matter during the last meeting. It is crucial for investigators to possess at least a minimum level of decency. The situation becomes even more troublesome as they had already discussed this issue in their previous meeting. 
Takuto responds to Carrie in a subdued voice, acknowledging that the brain eaters had been a negative influence on the girls. A two raises his voice once again, accusing the two of sicking the birdmen on the people. He emphasizes that if Takuto wishes to act like a father figure, he must exercise greater caution. Just then, Gia and Molter arrive on the scene, attempting to intervene and interrupt the escalating confrontation. A two slams her hand on the ground, declaring that it's time to address how to handle the situation in Dragonton. As everyone gathers around the conference table, their meeting is about to commence. Carrie, concerned, asks Takuto if he's all right. He responds with a smile, offering her a candy as reassurance. Carrie accepts it gratefully and thanks him. However, before the meeting can proceed, a two interrupts once again, demanding to know if the three of them in question have reflected on her earlier statements. Molter then chimes in, sharing the findings from the Airful Sisters' report, indicating that the city appears to be in a state of despair internally. Carrie nods in agreement, mentioning that she had the king confirm the dire situation in Dragon Anne as well. EML contributes by pointing out that while they were preoccupied with the conflict between the twins, given the circumstances, some form of chaos was inevitable sooner or later. The situation within the city is even more fragile than they had anticipated. A two, now calmer, remarks that the residents of the city must be feeling on edge. She suggests that their goal to attract immigrants to their country can now be pursued with more sustainability. Molter adds that they also discovered some of their dark elf clansmen reside in Dragonon. He tells Takuto that if he entrusts the task to him, he guarantees he will get them all to come. A two responds grimly, acknowledging it as good news, but cautioning that he's getting ahead of himself. They must prioritize dealing with the barbarians first. Both Gia and EML express agreement with her assessment. Takuto reflects on the natural desire to help one's clansmen when receiving such a report, but acknowledges that assistance can only be offered if they are willing to accept it. He suggests to the group that between the Dark Elves residing in the Forngon capital and potential immigrants from Dragonon, they may experience a significant population increase. Additionally, they have successfully forged a strong connection with the mayor, indicating that the meeting went smoothly. Takuto rises from his seat, feeling relieved as he had been close to having a heart attack. The next item on the agenda is addressing the barbarian threat, for which the Brain Eaters have provided a report. The report indicates that the barbarians consist of goblins, orcs, and occasionally even hill giants, with attacks ranging from a few individuals to several dozen. There have been a couple of days without attacks, but overall, the frequency of attacks is on the rise. According to the map of Dragonton, the city spans about two kilometers from east to west, with gates located to the northeast and south. The city is encircled by a mud wall, the highest points of which are barely sufficient to offer protection against hill giants. It's remarkable that the city has managed to withstand assaults for so long. When it comes to hill giants, it's common practice to evade direct confrontation and instead find ways to outmaneuver them. Dealing with goblins and orcs on a daily basis certainly presents its challenges. Molter adds that for the time being, he assumes that the twins and the brain eaters will not be joining them. The pressing question is who will be sent out to address the threat. They must ensure they select the right individuals for the task. Takuto reassures everyone, expressing confidence that everything will be fine, especially since a two is planning to participate. EML is taken aback by the news of a two's involvement. Molter then asks a two if she intends to utilize her skill snatcher ability for this mission. A two nods in agreement acknowledging that even seemingly weak opponents like barbarians possess skills worth acquiring, such as enhanced strength, outdoor survival abilities, and scouting expertise. She sees this as an opportunity to boost her own strength. Takuto responds, expressing his belief that strength may not necessarily be the primary concern. He suggests that to ensure the city's defense, representatives are needed to reassure the remaining citizens. Molter then proposes that if this is the case, Warrior Gia will remain behind to guard Minogra, while he himself takes on the task. He highlights the complexities involved in coordinating a military operation with allies, including negotiations. He asks Takuto if it's possible to allow him to handle the operation. Everyone is taken aback to hear Molter's request to participate. A two agrees, stating that they indeed need more manpower. Molter explains that he plans to bring along his apprentice, 
who has been trained to operate the magic research institute they are constructing. He believes that with their assistance, they can effectively manage battles, especially if they're just dealing with pesky goblins. Additionally, if their numbers are insufficient, they can also enlist the help of a few warriors. Gia wonders if Molter is referring to the long-legged bugs, considering their potential as additional reinforcements. Atu expresses her satisfaction with Molter's decision and emphasizes her desire to avoid casualties at all costs, placing her trust in him to handle the situation. However, Emel raises her hand to voice her concerns. She expresses worry that with Atu and Molter gone, and only warrior Gia remaining, there are still lingering concerns about the city's defenses. Responding with a wicked smile, Atu reveals that she has already considered this issue and takes something out, indicating that she has a plan in place to address their defense concerns. She announces that they will designate the hero Isla as the cornerstone of their defense. Isla, much like Atu, is the queen of bugs and is one of the revered heroes of Minogra. She informs them that Isla's production is nearing completion at the perfect time indicating that Takuto's decision to expedite her production was indeed correct. Both Marie and Carrie commend Takuto's intelligence for foreseeing the importance of accelerating Isla's production. Currently, their defense strategy encompasses Isla, the long-legged bugs, and the forest terrain bonuses of the Dark Elves. In addition to Isla's formidable combat prowess, she possesses the ability to bolster all insect units. With the reinforced long-legged bugs and the cursed terrain effect augmented by the Dark Elves, their defense is fortified. Excitedly, Takuto urges Atu to proceed with this strategy. Rising from his seat, he emphatically slams his hand on the table, signaling to everyone to initiate the mission. They are fully prepared to commence production of Isla. Atu is filled with excitement as Isla is finally going to be brought into existence. They have eagerly awaited this day and have expended numerous resources in preparation for it. Despite the burden it placed on them, they believe it will ultimately pay off. Carrie inquires about the nature of the hero they are about to summon. Takuto responds with a smile, indicating that they will soon find out. Meanwhile, Atu privately ponders what she thinks will happen with Isla, using personal telepathy. She contemplates whether it will align with their cause or not. Takuto reflects on his previous units all of which were established as subordinates, with him naturally assuming the role of their commander and producer. However, Isla's case is unique. In the world of Eternal Nations, players can choose from various commanders. Isla serves as both a selectable commander and a unit within the game. This means that if it possesses free will as a commander, she could potentially take control of Minogra. With the power of the insect units she produces, they could overwhelm the nation. In fact, the game even introduced a system allowing commanders to be changed or to overthrow each other, adding a layer of complexity to the situation. And even if she has memories of him like a two, she might even show ignorance and turn on him. Determined to secure their position, Takuto extends his hand and invokes a dark spell upon Isla. The atmosphere becomes charged with tension as his dark energy envelopes her. A two vows to protect him at all costs but Takuto is acutely aware that he cannot summon Isla again if this attempt fails. Standing beside Isla, surrounded by his dark energy, Takuto witnesses the sky darkening and the materials gathered for its production being drawn into the swirling vortex of his spell. Molter watches in shock, struggling to comprehend the gravity of the situation. Finally, the materials are consumed by the darkness, leaving behind a foreboding dark circle where Takuto stands, visibly stunned and bewildered by the outcome. As the dark circle expands and swirls around them, Atu gazes at it, contemplating Takuto's earlier concerns. He observes the massive, swirling vortex and ponders the unlikelihood of Isla's betrayal. Meanwhile, Atu looks up at the towering figure that emerges from the darkness, wondering if everything is proceeding as planned with Isla now before them. With a sense of relief, Takuto calls out its name. Isla, silently observing Takuto, thankfully does not display hostility towards them. After a brief moment of silence, she swiftly moves towards Takuto, subtly disturbing her surroundings as she does so. In the next moment, Isla kneels before Takuto, addressing him as her great king. She respectfully expresses her honor at meeting him in such circumstances. Isla, who reigns over all bugs, 
is filled with joy and emotion at the prospect of serving her master once more. Takuto is stunned by her words and silently gazes at her, while the dark elves express excitement at hearing her speak. Gia notes that Isla's voice carries the maturity of an older woman. Overwhelmed by emotion, Takuto trembles and falls to his knees before her, acknowledging that it has been a long time since they last met. He asks Isla how she remembers him, to which Isla reassures him to take it easy as she vividly remembers Ira Takuto. She encourages him to utilize her power to his heart's content. Atu then orders everyone to return to their tasks. Turning her attention back to Isla, she remarks on the passage of time, wondering if she should consider it a reunion or a new acquaintance. She approaches Isla, getting straight to the point. Atu asks Isla if she remembers playing games with Takuto. Isla responds excitedly, her voice filled with affection, affirming that she remembers every moment with him deeply ingrained in her heart. She addresses Takuto, expressing her confusion about the presence of the Dark Elves. She asks him if he could explain the current situation to her. He responds, suggesting that they discuss the matter in a more appropriate setting. Using mind telepathy, Atu advises Takuto against explaining the situation until they are certain that Isla will faithfully serve them. Isla reassures Atu, saying she won't take Takuto away from her. Observing their interaction, Takuto thinks to himself that they seem to get along well. After arriving at Takuto's palace, Isla grasps the situation at hand. Takuto expresses his acknowledgement that there are many things he doesn't fully understand, but he has managed to come this far with the two's support. She looks at Takuto and acknowledges that she has been able to work diligently because of him. Observing their interaction, Isla quietly murmurs to herself, recognizing that they have entered their own little world. Interrupting their moment, Isla states that she understands their strategy and declares her determination to protect this peaceful kingdom in this mysterious land. She asserts that she is indeed a defensive hero, emphasizing her role in safeguarding their kingdom. She reveals that she has already produced long-legged bugs, and suggests that they consider increasing their unit count through the breeder skill. It then looks at a two, noting that this implies that the one heading to Forngon to repel the barbarians is the offensive hero, a two the sludge. A two, overwhelmed by emotion, falls into Takuto's lap, expressing her feelings that she will be so lonely without him. He tenderly pats her head and apologizes to her, acknowledging that she is the only one capable of undertaking this task. Meanwhile, Isla feels anxious about the upcoming challenge, wondering if everything will be all right. Despite her apprehension, she finds herself overwhelmed with excitement. Reflecting on her newfound sense of purpose, Isla realizes that simply being able to live is a significant blessing for her. Atu addresses Takuto, expressing her hope that he enjoys his new game as much as she does. Isla then kneels before them, assuring them to leave the details to her. The mission to fight the barbarians has been dispatched under the leadership of Atu and Molter. The scene transitions to the palace, where Isla voices her frustration, lamenting that Takuto seems incapable of doing anything by himself. She notes that he doesn't wake up until late in the afternoon, leaving her puzzled about how he managed to live until now. Isla highlights that it has only been a few days since Atu departed. Marie explains that the king has always had the habit of sleeping until lunchtime. Carrie adds that if the king isn't awake by then, they usually go with Atu to wake him up. Isla becomes visibly frustrated by this revelation, expressing her disbelief that the great leader of Minogra and the king of the ruin is not only sleeping until the afternoon but also relying on two little girls to wake him up. Takuto reflects on the differences between Atu, who allows him to do as he pleases, and Isla, who is straightforward and meticulous in character. Takuto muses to himself about the irony of summoning her only to receive a lecture from her. Isla, noticing his reaction, admonishes him, reminding him that he can't act spoiled as he's a grown man. She asserts that tomorrow morning he will wake up on his own before breakfast. Just then, Emel arrives in a state of emergency, urgently asking for Isla's presence. Clinging to her, Emel informs her that Gia has once again broken the equipment, causing a loss rate that exceeds their budget plan. Isla pats her reassuringly, acknowledging the value of enthusiasm but also expressing her disapproval of breaking things. She promises to scold the warrior captain for the incident. 
She suggests that they could review the planning together, but admits there are many aspects she is currently unfamiliar with. Taking charge, she swiftly moves around and calls Marie and Carrie to accompany her, instructing them to guide her around Minogra. Surprised by her request, they comply, leading Isla to the part of the palace where the officials work. One of the officials stands up, addressing Isla respectfully as Lady Isla, and offers his assistance. Isla responds, stating that she doesn't have any specific requests and that she is here today to learn. Carrie explains to the officials that Isla-san wishes to be of use to his majesty, and she wants to observe them at work so they can both determine what role fits her best. Marie elaborates on the part of the palace where they handle budgets and study finance, where they assess if they can achieve their desired goals. Carrie explains to Isla that in addition to administrative evaluations, they also conduct meetings where everyone convenes to determine their essentials and assess whether they use too many resources. She further informs her that they have conducted a census of about 500 citizens, showing the documents to her. Carrie mentions that Amuru was kind enough to provide this primer document from her work materials. Isla looks at the documents and expresses her gratitude to Carrie. Isla contemplates that it would be beneficial to have these young girls under her care, as they appear earnest and clever. She considers it convenient to learn about Dragon Hunt from them, given their knowledge and demeanor. Although she has heard about them from Atu and the king, she wants to observe them for herself. Meanwhile, in the study room, Takuto remains asleep in the afternoon. Isla notes that the next stop is the magic research lab, which is conveniently close to the palace. Carrie informs Isla that the laboratory is typically managed by Molter, but since everyone has left for Dragonton, it's currently closed. Just then, two researchers approach Isla from the opposite direction. Isla queries Carrie about their unexpected arrival, and the researchers explain that they have already finished cleaning the laboratory and are now tidying up the ceremonial site. Isla promptly commends them for their diligent work. Following this, they proceed to the warrior's training site where Gia approaches them and inquires if Lady Isla is there to observe. Isla informs Gia that she is there to inspect the equipment. He is taken aback by the mention of equipment issues. Isla explains that upon reviewing the documents, she noticed a significant loss of equipment, prompting her concerns. She suggests that perhaps there is an issue with safekeeping, or that there have been oversights in handling the equipment. She proposes that they check the storage area together, as it is not a large space. She asks Gia if they should begin the inspection. She instructs another warrior to make his report. The warrior remarks that Gia cannot be stopped once he gets into a Spartan mindset. However, he adds that Gia really needs to reflect on his actions. Isla decides to take charge of the situation moving forward. She commends Gia for coming up with a better idea and expresses her pride in his efforts. However, the other warriors notice that Gia's facial expressions seem insincere. Isla stands alongside Carrie and Marie while all the warriors stand in front of them with their heads down, indicating a sense of respect or submission. Afterward, they arrive at the government office, where the human flesh tree plantation is currently in progress. Continuing their tour, they visit fields where various vegetables and fruits are being grown. Isla walks around the fields, observing the crops. Finally, they reach the medical center where the brain eaters warmly welcome both Marie and Carrie with excitement. Isla stands before them, observing their actions. Suddenly, someone informs them that dinner is ready, prompting them to head to the food distribution center. In the middle of the area lies a large pit where food is prepared and served. Carrie explains to Isla Sama that since they are still adjusting to their lives here, they have decided to do everything together in this central location. They also repair their tools and clothes there. Isla nods in understanding and inquires what they do in their own residences. Carrie explains to her that currently, their residences are only used as places to sleep. Due to the limited number of houses available, only individuals with families are allocated a house. However, since both Carrie and Marie, along with everyone else, used to live without a place to rest, they find the current living conditions more than satisfactory. Isla acknowledges this as a benevolent act from their king. She reflects on how they could entrust hard labor to her cute little nymphs, but they still rely on the Dark Elves for skilled labor, which necessitates intelligence. Isla concludes that her summoning and the Alliance were understandable moves to advance their development.
Here I am.